All right, what's up, everybody? We got 10-ish minutes here with Mr. Ryan Muckenhern, and you all knew this one was coming because as we reach the end of, uh, of a podcast, that's, I'm just, for whatever reason, it's escaping me right now, but we asked Ryan what his favorite cartridge of all time was. And what did he say? He said the 4570 government. Is that correct, Ryan? It's one of my favorites of all time. But well, now you're saying it's one well, of them. I, it, 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 I do. I, the Is name that, escapes me of the podcast, but I do remember you said it was your favorite. There wasn't it this. Might be my favorite cartridge to reload. It might be my favorite cartridge for its versatility and for the cool rifles that it comes in. Is it your favorite cartridge for backtracking? Ooh. <laughs> Ouch! <laughs> wow. Well, I took uh, a sip of this refreshing beverage. Oh, you know what? Anyway, that was probably that, that was a little Ryan's bit more a little pointed than it. That, that, a I did sparkly. not mean that pointed. That was no, Mark's that now was completely. No, I'm backtracking. backtracking. Okay, uh, it was in jest. All right, Ryan, tell us a little bit about the 4570 and what makes it so awesome. Uh it's very old, very old. It uh, began development in like 1871. Was released in 1873. Uh, it was a replacement for an old military cartridge that was 50 caliber, a black powder cartridge as well. Um, this is what we saw come, well, sort of neither of these actually, more this one than this one, uh, was what we saw come out for the Trapdoor Springfield. The one that straight up looks like a tube lipstick. <laughs> yeah, correct. Even uh, with this uh, red powder coated projectile. It, it wouldn't have had that projectile. It actually wouldn't have had really anything bearing much semblance to that projectile. It would have been a different projectile altogether. But it was a forty five seventy um, for the 1873 Springfield, which we have one here at the shop, by the way, which is really cool. Very old one. That one was made in 1881. Uh, anyhow, <clears throat> modernization of uh, this, this previous 50 caliber um, chambering that they had in, in a uh, military arm, um, this was a service cartridge for a long time. And did it, like, what's so prolific about it? How has it stayed around all this time? Is it just, like, it? what does it do? Does it do anything particularly super well? Or was it the father of a bunch of other things? Or? Um, not really. Not the father of anything. It does a lot of things really well. Uh, the original factory loading was, I guess by today's standards, fairly anemic. I mean, it was barely above a muzzle loader. And I think probably the only thing it, it offered an advantage to the muzzle loader besides the projectile technology having that, that conical shaped bullet um, was it was contained. So right. you could just put another one in and shoot it, uh, which was certainly advantageous. When and, they when that was a first adopted by the military, I'm trying to say you mentioned, was that in a repeater then? Single or shot. Single shot. Yep. Okay. So they call it a trap door. So just forward of the hammer um, on the, it looked like a musket. Okay, it was right. actually an adaptation of a musket. The uh, rifle employed like a, a, a lift breech is what I'm going to call it, <clears throat> where you unlocked a lever and you lifted the top of the receiver up and a, a small piece of metal barely longer than this would swing up. The mm -hmm. case would come out. You'd put a new one in, slide it forward, close it, cock the hammer and fire it. Um, so really clever gun. So, Still very much faster than uh, shoving powder and definitely. pull it down the front. And Absolutely. There, and there were cartridge guns before this one but this one was a big standardization and modernization now it is a straight wall yes so uh i can't remember if we've talked about really any other straight wall cartridges on this uh podcast not a yet. ton so explain the whole straight wall thing it's it's fairly obvious when we looked at it i already mentioned it, it looks like a tube of lipstick so yep. it doesn't have the nice bottleneck kind of sexy shape to it no. um but these days that means that you can actually use it for some special areas or special seasons and yes. things like that uh go into that a little bit sure so a couple of states uh especially up here in the midwest and i don't know if there's any out liars in any other parts of the country, the exception of Louisiana, that allows you to use a 4570 as a muzzleloader in their primitive weapon season, which is interesting. Hell yeah. Um, hey, you know, it is primitive. Um, straight wall is that. It, it does not have a bottleneck, as you noted. It's just from the, the case head and web up straight. And that just makes, what does a bottleneck exactly do? Does the bottleneck help increase pressure without increasing overall size of the case? or Partly, yes. Right. We, can, we can go down to a smaller bullet. Okay. Um, in a similar sized case, we get higher velocity. So like okay. we talked about the 3030 uh, and kind of how that was a very early bottleneck cartridge. Um, and didn't come along too terribly long after the 4570 was standardized. Um, but <clears throat> the straight wall seasons that are out there for deer hunting uh, allow a shooter 
uh, probably a more efficient and ethical means of take when compared to, say, a conventional inline muzzleloader or a 12-gauge shotgun, which this would presumably be taking the place of. So um, we'll fast forward a little bit and we'll look at this cool round that probably a lot of people have seen before and will be seeing more of. Um, this is Hornady's very famous lever evolution round for the 4570. Um, oh, yeah. Which took this cartridge from 1873 technology into the 25th century. Uh, so very aerodynamic bullet with a very special tip on it, and they're, they're squishy. And this is notable because a lot of times these come in lever guns um, that have tubular magazines. Got it. Um, but they loaded these things pretty snoozy. So they, they are quite fast, quite powerful. So 325 grain bullet at like 2,200 feet per second. Oh, that's and, significant. Yeah, and while it doesn't, I mean, it's not like a 30-odd six or anything like that. For a large 45 caliber projectile, it's very fast and relatively flat um, and r- took a lot of these rifles out of the old archaic iron sight era into heck put a scope on it and use it on large game up to and including elk bear and moose at pretty moderate distances like 300 yards is not yeah. out of the question um, and, and actually when this had come out <clears throat> I can remember Marlin uh, coming out with a line of lever guns um, in their 1895 series that, that were kind of tailored around this load or, or to go in tandem with this load. We had longer barrels. We had scope mounting provisions. Um, huh. the, the rifles were really modernized. I mean, they're still a lever gun in the conventional sense, but uh, they got a lot of modern flair to them. That's pretty cool. Very cool. What? Uh, so you've used the 4570 a lot. Yes. In your hunts. Yes. Now, is that what you're using is the lever evolution? This is... Or are you uh, using... Because you use the 4570, it's more of like a romantic thing for you, right? I get a kick out of it. You get a kick out of it because it's old school. It feels special when you use it. Yes. So are you using then more of this? Because you, you immediately went to this when I asked you what you're using primarily. This this lipstick looking... What is the powder coat? Yeah, okay. What's the deal? On that one. So... This, let's, let's address the powder coat It seems coat like it's room. just going to get scraped off as soon as it starts obturating. What's up, Luke? Uh, <laughs> obturating down Luke the barrel. Luke, your big words. <laughs> uh, and it doesn't, which is really crazy. Is I was crazy. very nervous about that, but it doesn't. I did a lot of research on this. Um, so with a lot of these older cartridges that used predominantly lead bullets, mm-hmm. um, if you wanted to shoot them faster than their lead bullets would allow, typically, you had to employ what's called a gas check on the back of the bullet, which is a copper cup that goes around the base of the bullet that I would then need to get another die for so I could size said copper cup around the base of my bullet so that I could shoot it at higher velocities. Okay. The gun that I'm shooting it out of is an 1885 high wall. um, And I wanted to push those bullets a little bit faster than 1,200 or 1,300 feet per second, which is kind of the nominal loading for 4570. Um, and I didn't want a gas check. I also didn't want to shoot jacketed bullets. Why? I don't know. They were expensive and there's pretty limited bullet offerings. So I, I wanted a lighter weight to increase velocity. Um, and in order to do that, I would have to go with either bullets I didn't like for one reason or another or very expensive bullets. Um, and I didn't want to go with very expensive bullets because there's a lot of lead and a lot of material there. Those very expensive bullets are disproportionately more expensive than other bullets that I was shooting. So instead of gas checking, enter powder coating. Um, so these are powder coated. They effectively eliminate entirely the need for gas checking because that, that uh, increased pressure at obturation is not going to like liquefy and vaporize the lead from my projectile and deposit it on my bore. And it's not going to cause streaking and, and all the issues that come along with a non-gas-checked, so, high-velocity lead projectile. Is it almost then like a lubricant, almost like a dry lubricant of kind the of, sorts? Kind of. What's really crazy <clears throat> is if we take this bullet, just the bullet, not the case, loaded projectile, whole thing, just the bullet, and you put it on a table and you strike it with a hammer, Yeah. it squishes, but the powder coat goes with it. And it does not expose lead. So what? You, yeah, it's crazy. The powder coat doesn't crack or it, anything? Like it, it, it'll... Very, very, very minorly crack. If it's a, I made up a word there, minorly. Um, no, it's very strong. It's extremely resilient. 
Is that a, I mean, is that a common thing that people are using? Yes. So what, what is the powder coat doing that's different than like the copper jacket on the lever evolution? Nothing. Nothing. It's encapsulating the lead. Okay. Huh. But it's, it's doing it at, at, in such a thin application that I don't need to resize for my bore. Because I do have a sizing die that I can size these bullets down incrementally to fit. I don't need to. Um, and it's, again, it's preventing that lead from depositing onto my bore. Um, and it allows me, like this load is 350 grain projectile at 1,950 feet per second. So it's plenty okay. fast. And is this, yeah. this is just because you wanted to reload for that then? You just felt like it? Yeah, I because wanted... Because you just didn't feel like using what's already made and done super snoozy and cool. So those those are really expensive. Yes. They don't shoot that great out of that gun. Oh, okay. And they hurt really bad to shoot. <laughs> um, so that rifle's got a crescent butt plate, which was really common in the day. Um, so I've read it was for horsemen um, for helping... Keep, oh, sure. I can see that. It kind of... Keep that rifle... Steady and square. Sure. Um, whether that's true or not, I, I don't know. It seems to be a sporting It theory. makes sense. It's almost like you're kind of bracing it on uh, both sides of the old shoulder. Yeah. So I have shot these out of them. And I, I should say whether they shoot good or not is, I guess, up for debate because they hurt bad. Um, and so uh, I, I don't like shooting them out of them. These are quite pleasant. They shoot exceptionally well. Um, we've knocked the Rams over at Winnequat with them. So That's at about, what is that, like 560? 500 meters. 500 meters. Okay. Got so, it. I mean, that, those, and those are big pieces of steel. I mean, that's that's enough. Uh, that's a little oomph at. How much drop are you getting at 500 meters? Many feet. Many feet. Yes. Yeah. So I've got. I would imagine. I've got a, a an adjustable rear sight that I can. Oh, that's right. You don't go. You're not even traditional optics. Or I'm sorry. You, you are, I guess, like very, very traditional. But you're not yeah. using uh, magnified <laughs> optics or, or glass on top of this, right? Yeah. Trad sights. Just irons. This is, this is the trad bow of rifles, is what Ryan has going on with this 4570. You have all the, you've got a super lightweight 308 mountain gun. You've got all these. Somebody actually asked, how many shotguns? Have you ever counted yet how many shotguns you have? Anyway, no, not worth it. Somebody told you to buy you've got a shotgun, all this, you did. You've got all this fancy stuff. You've got all the Tikas in the world, and, and yet you just have to go back to this trad gun, the old 4570. I'll tell you, kicks. But my hunting partner and I uh, talked for many, many, many years about hunting the West with uh, like traditional rifles. And by that, I mean, like uh, he shoots an 1877 Sharps. I shoot an 1885 Highwall. Um, and we flirted with it for many years, like a decade. And then a couple of years ago, I finally said, heck with it, I'm going to buy one. So I did. And then he has couple of those sharps and we went out we each took a couple mule deer about six seconds apart from each other (laughs) and then i took an antelope and then i took a white tail and i hope to take a bear an elk and a bison um that'd be fun yeah and see what else we can do but back on on the cartridges real quick i think there's like there's been some interesting um divergent evolution if that's if that's correct with them so like the traditional loading 405 grain projectile um, you know, large round nose or, or semi round nose flat point profile shape, anemic velocity, 1200 feet per second, or even less sometimes. Um, that was the mainstay forever. And, you know, when Winchester introduced it into their line with their 1886 lever gun that held fast and then Marlin picked it up and, and, um, you know, that, that kept going for a long time. There really wasn't a lot of change. Remington came out with some higher velocity jacketed hollow point stuff, um, but the rifles were really no different. They were all the same. Um, Ruger came out with the number one, really strong action. Browning always had the 1885 high wall, really strong action. Hornady then, um, I think, capitalized on that with the, the strength of those modern actions, and they came out with this loading. And this is a completely different animal to me. It's like a whole different cartridge altogether because it does things so differently. Huh. Um, and with this new, I'm going to call it new straight wall ca- craze, it's been around for a while. Um, that is, that is a 300 yard lethal package. Like, yeah. No questions about it. In, in these modern lever guns or modern single shots, uh, they're fantastic. You can get a revolver chambered in 4570 if you want. Would you want to? It's a handful. I've okay. shot it. Yeah. Yes. Let me, uh, let me ask you this one more question from, uh, from me here is, do you have the gun in 4570 that is your dream firearm chambered in 4570 or 
do you have yet to acquire mm. said gun? What would what would it be if you don't already have it? I have mostly the gun that I want in forty five seventy. What's missing? Um, you said you've got this traditional butt plate. You've got these traditional sights. See, that's the one with the octo- octagonal barrel, right? So it's not like a okay. Yeah. If I was going to have it, I would be calling up like C sharps and saying I would like to build a rifle okay. from top to bottom. Um, and I would build it uh, much to my uh, fancy. I would have a lot of nice things on it. I would not have a crescent butt plate. I would have a pewter forend. I would have different sights. I would have a half octagon, half round barrel. Um, it would probably be 30 inches in length. Uh, it would have exceptional walnut and a cheek piece. Um, and it would be uh, the kind of rifle that if I was a... Would it have decorations on the receiver? Probably, if anything... I don't know. Maybe not. Maybe a little flare or some scrolling. Maybe nothing yeah. crazy. Probably case colored, or mm. I would have it French grade. One of the two. What's French grade? French grade is a really pretty color. Um, so it's a uh, just a process done to steel to somewhat help weatherproof it, and it ends up being a light satin gray. It's very very attractive. Sounds French. Um, it, it is. Yep. <laughs> there we are. Um, if if I was a commercial buffalo hunter and like. <laughs> 45, I'm thinking about getting back into that game. <laughs> 4570 came out at the tail end of the big um, Buffalo kill off, the genocide, if you want to call it that, where we, we nearly drove one of the greatest animals of all time into complete and total extinct, extinction. So 4570 was not actually the most popular during that time. Okay. They were shooting 5090 sharps, 5100s, 5110s, 45110s, um, 4590s, things like that. Um, you could have gone and gotten yourself a real fancy rifle from the Sharps Rifle Company, and you mm. just sat up there on that that train and rolled them with that. Yeah, yeah, I, I would do something, do something like that. That gun sounds absolutely amazing and breathtaking and full of history and nostalgia. And I'll tell you, if I get one of these things, Ryan, it'll just be simply to take advantage of one of these new newer straight wall seasons uh in lieu of say like a muzzleloader or a shotgun and it will probably be some moderately priced synthetic stock <laughs> if i was i'll tell you check uh, out check be... out the new henry levers man they have done a really good job hmm. on their lever guns and i'll Paint it. and i probably will shoot the lever evolution because it comes in a box yep. and get one of them new guns and then paint it like one of ryan's french guns <laughs> <laughs> it's French great. Look at it. Uh, all right. Good stuff. Ryan, thank you very much for telling us about uh, one of your favorite cartridges ever. We appreciate it. Yes. Thank you, Ryan. Okay. Bye, everybody. Let us know what you think about the 4572. Bye. Bye. Sounds French. <laughs> so, this powder coating yes. is being used in lieu. Of a jacket, basically. Sort of, yeah. And that's are just you keep... sending these out to get powder coated, or are, are you buying them already powder coated? Acme Bullet Company. <laughs> they ship. Do they also <laughs> ship anvils to Wiley Coyote <laughs> and Roadrunner? Great company. That's where I get all my dynamite. Wisconsin company. They ship the bullets in a wood box. And it's just it's like a tiny little wood box that like has a dovetailed lid on it. Yeah. And it just says Acme on the side. It doesn't get any better than that. And then it has like caliber 45, weight 350, and then RNFP, round nose flat point. Powder coating is a cool process. I mean, is that the same powder coating that you would like powder coat a jig, a lead jig head with? That is automotive grade powder coat. So that's this is, probably yep. different. Is it, no, is same, it same thing, 100%. Applied via electrostatic. electrostatic. Yeah. Yep. So I think they tumble them they get them up to a pretty decent rate of speed so they develop that static and they just chuck it in there and then <laughs> they're just yeah. caked in it they throw it in a big box put it in an oven for a predetermined amount of time and out comes that that's pretty much how paint is applied to new cars these days yeah. too you just like see a car go into a big like room and then basically like paint is entered into the room and then the car gets the chassis gets basically they charge those right they yeah, like they put ch- a current to them yeah they do and then, and then like all the paint just so it's not like a not anymore but then you get perfect you get like as close to perfect coating as you can because no spots get missed unbelievable i learned about a thing called um 
Fortnite. You heard about this? Fortnite. Yeah. yeah Wait, Fortnite. Why? It's a good game. No, not for. Uh, so it comes out of Detroit. Yeah. And when they used to paint cars in the conventional means, the paint booths would get this like layers of paint, like up to a foot thick. Oh yeah, sure. yeah. And they break them off and they chuck them, and they call this Fortnite. <laughs> and so these people have snuck into inner city Detroit and mined Fordite out of these dumps, landfills, and scrap heaps. They cut them into little pieces, and they sell them for jewelry making. Oh, and my so gosh. And so cool, it's cool stuff. It looks like an agate. But so as you, like, shape it, you get varying layers of color. And so, Oh, because of all the different oh, paints they use yeah. in the booth? So oh, like, I can see it being like a... Um, like an agate. <sighs> like an agate. I'm, I'm just I'm picturing all these striations. That's the word that I was looking for. 100%. Sounds super cool. 